so um, as Alessandra said, I'm going to uh, talk about how the, a couple of projects in our, in our lab where we look, use defects in HIV replication to try and understand certain aspects of host virus interactions. Now, I know some of you are... Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Right. I know uh, quite a few of you are virologists, so you will know the life cycle of HIV, but for, you, for those of you that don't, I'll just say a few general comments. So HIV is a retrovirus, which means it has an RNA genome, and the hallmarks of retroviral infection are that once the virus gets into the cell, it has, its RNA genome is copied into uh, double-stranded DNA, which when it goes into the nucleus, integrates into the chromosome chromosomal DNA and establishes a persistent infection that will last the lifetime of that cell. Once in the nucleus in this form, it's treated much like any cellular gene. It is transcribed by RNA polymerase II. RNA transcripts are made and processed in the nucleus, are exported out into the cytoplasm, translated into viral proteins, and viral proteins and RNA will come together to assemble nascent virus particles that will then bud out through the plasma membrane and form the next round of infectious virus particles. Now, just like any other virus, of course, HIV requires many, many cellular factors to accomplish its replication cycle. So there are many cofactors and pathways that are essential for virus replication that contribute in a positive way. Likewise, as we'll come onto one of these later, cells also encode a number of proteins and factors within cells that are very potent inhibitors of virus replication. And of course, successful viruses have to have devised evasion mechanisms or inhibitory mechanisms to overcome these resistance factors. I'm going to talk about two different projects in the lab today, one of which actually deals with a positively acting cellular factor, and one of which deals with a family of negatively acting cellular factors. And as I said at the outset, our general approach in the lab is often to look at situations where HIV is unable to replicate, be it because of a mutation that's been put in the virus or a particular, say, cells of a particular species that don't support particular steps of replication. And that's generally our starting point for then trying to unravel what's going wrong to then try and understand what's going right when HIV can replicate in a human cell. And a very informative experiment that will come up in both sets of uh, work is this one here, we're summarized here, where you take a cell that is unable to support whatever step of replication you're interested in and fuse it in the lab to a cell that does support whatever step you're interested in and looking at what the outcome is when you f look at that fused cell or heterocarion. And, it, and a, a simple interpretation of the data are that if the fused cell recapitulates the restrictive or non-permissive phenotype, the argument is that these cells then contain some, some factor which imposes that block. On the other hand, if you get a phenotype where the fused cell recapitulates the permissive uh, uh, outcome, the argument is that the reason these were non-permissive is that they happen to lack whatever cofactor it is. So in that case, you're looking at a positive factor, and in this case, you're looking for a negative factor, and we'll see one example of each. Something else we're interested in a lot in the lab are these accessory proteins. HIV, when it was uh, first uh, cloned in 1984, it was rapidly recognized that unlike other retroviruses that had been described previously, HIV encodes six additional genes beyond the gag, poll, and envelope genes that are required for virus replication. And my lab has always been interested in these additional genes and what they may do for virus replication. And a few general observations about these are that they're all essential in vivo. And what they all are are basically adapters that pull together different molecules in the context of an infected cell and allow bi biological function to be manifested. They're all positively acting. In fact, they all help promote virus replication. And it has turned out over the last 25 years, they've been excellent <coughs> models for understanding fundamental biological processes. And more recently, it turns out that probably three or four of them are in fact involved in, in overcoming various resistance or innate immune uh, activities in cells. So to start out with, uh, I'm going to talk about viral assembly, and that is because um, it's been known for a long time, this is not work from my own group, but work from many other groups, 
that HIV is very poor at making infectious virus particles in cells of other species, particularly in rodent cells. And there are a number of reasons for this. In fact, there are many reasons why HIV is unable to replicate in rodent cells. First of all, the, the murine or rodent uh, receptors don't work for HIV entry, but if you, put, you can put the human receptors in and recapitulate entry. HIV transcription does not work well in rodent cells, but you can put in the TAT cofactor, uh, cyclin T1, and recapitulate active uh, transcription. But even when you do all of that, HIV can't replicate, and it's been recognized for a long time there are, there are ill-defined blocks around the area of RNA processing and nuclear export, as well as assembly itself. Uh, <clears throat> that don't, go, don't proceed properly in, in rodent cells and are able to establish a block to replication. Uh, just a few words about how viral HIV RNAs get out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. It's actually been a model for understanding nuclear export for many years. So cellular RNAs recruit either, either, either RNAs that do not contain introns or RNAs that originally contain introns. They recruit a nuclear export factor called NXF1 and that then allows RNAs to move out into the cytoplasm. Viral RNA, retroviral RNAs have some complex problems to overcome in that a subset of viral RNAs contain introns, and so it's rather unusual for an intron containing RNA to, to get out into the cytoplasm, and different retroviruses have solved this problem in different ways. So mason Pfizer monkey virus, uh, which is a complex retrovirus found in, naturally found in monkeys, has, a, has an RNA stem loop that actually actively recruits NXF1, this export factor, to that and allows that, uh, that RNA to make it out into the cytoplasm. HIV has solved the problem in a different way. It encodes a specific protein, REV, another one of its accessory proteins, that binds to an RNA element sitting in unspliced RNA and recruits a protein called CRIM1, which normally is an export factor for, leucine, for proteins containing leucine-rich motifs. But by recruiting that CRIM1, that is then able to move this RNA out into the cytoplasm. So, if you take a RNA which is REV responsive and expresses a viral structure of proteins, in 3T3 cells you can express the GAG protein very effectively, but it doesn't make it out into the cytoplasm. I mean, the, the protein is expressed, it doesn't assemble, and, and, part, and uh, viral particles are not uh, exported into the, or, or export into the culture supernatant whereas in human cells that works very efficiently. And uh, Chad Swanson, a former uh, PhD student in my lab, noticed some time ago that if you switch the RNA export element on uh, this, co this expression construct, such that he put in four copies of the constitutive transport element from Mason Pfizer monkey virus, now you're able to produce gag proteins that could assemble into virus particles, and those particles could be uh, 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 could leave the cells and be and, and be in the uh, and be uh, produced into the um, uh, could leave cells and get into the uh, culture supernatant. So this argued then that the RNA export pathway was very important for how the gag proteins functioned subsequently and were able to undergo uh, virus particle assembly. Uh, you can actually just see this visually here. So here is, here is a, a rev-responsive construct. You don't see any virus particles. You put in the constitutive transport element, and you see lots of virus particles forming in these murine cells. Um, we know this is assembly and not uh, rates of virus for, of um, protein synthesis. And one has to be very careful in these experiments because, because viral assembly is itself a, a coordinated process uh, that is becomes more efficient as, as higher levels of protein are present. You have to make sure when you do these experiments that you're not just looking at a, a secondary consequence of having uh, high levels of protein expression. So in a lot of these experiments, we're very cautious about measuring protein synthesis rates using very short pulses of using radio-labeled amino acids. So for example, here, when we're comparing the, the RRE and REV uh, situation with the four copies of the constitutive transport element, we can see at this dose of transfected plasma, we've got the same rate of protein synthesis as here. And when you look at the amount of virus being released into the culture supernatant at that level, you can see there's a very healthy boost to virus production, indicating that the CTE really does promote virus assembly. Uh, many other groups have shown over the years, in fact, you can make mutations in the GAG protein that also uh, have the same effect. 
and that is because the, uh, the association of the, the viral gag protein with the plasma in the side of the plasma membrane is heavily regulated by a, an, acylate, uh, an acyl modification, a marissal modification on the amino terminus of gag, which is, as gag is made, is buried on the interior of the protein and then later gets exposed in a so-called marissal switch mechanism. Well, you can, you can uh, trigger that uh, prematurely by making various mutations in the, in the gag protein, which force the gag protein to uh, interact with the plasma membrane more, ra more rapidly in rodent cells and therefore assemble particles more efficiently. And here's one particular mutation here, uh, L21S, does the same thing. We did a whole load of experiments. This was mainly worked by Nathan Shearer, a former postdoc in the lab, and he showed that, in fact, the changes in the gag protein are not synergistic with effects of the CTE, arguing that these two elements are not different steps in the assembly process. We, in fact, think the uh, Bristol switch and the, and the RNA export pathway somehow converge in some way to promote virus assembly. And, of course, the long-term goal of the lab is to try and understand the details of that. So just to summarize what I've said so far, HIV uh, gag, uh, genomic RNA biogenesis and trafficking are determined for species tropism. Uh, the REV-RE regulated post-transcriptional steps of HIV replication are inherently inefficient in murine cells. Uh, you can manipulate RNA export uh, to stimulate HIV assembly, and this is independent of effects on GAG expression. Mutations in the matrix region of GAG that induce membrane association also promote HIV assembly in murine cells. And a, as I just said, this suggests a model whereby membrane targeting, RNA traffic, uh, trafficking, and matrix function converge to promote an aspect promote an aspect of HIV assembly, and that this is inherently uh, defective in murine cells. Uh, and why is it defective? Well, using a cell fusion experiment of the type that I outlined earlier, if you fuse mouse and human cells together, you get a very large boost to virus production, as opposed to arguing then that what the, the problem in mouse cells is there is a lack of factors that are present in human cells so that when you fuse the two together, you recapitulate the human cell phenotype, and that is one that facilitates viral assembly. And that is, those are experiments that were initially done by uh, Paul Beanash, uh, in Paul Beanash when he was in Brian Cullen's lab, and also in Ned Landau's group uh, about 10 years ago. Interestingly, and a very important point, and this is work from uh, Richard Sutton's group, is it turns out the only part of the human genome you need is chromosome 2. So if you use, look at mouse-human somatic cell hybrids, uh, they, as long as you've got human chromosome 2 in there, in the rodent cells, you also get very good assembly. So at that time, we thought we would use this mouse system as a way of screening for factors that could promote virus assembly. So the assay is very simple. You just take mouse cells, co-transfect them with this REV-RE, expression vector making gag and pol, which does not normally make very good or very many virus particles, and co-transfect it with various human cDNAs and see whether you could boost virus production. And we, we went through uh, the literature that had been published on, on human proteins that had been reported as being uh, involved in binding to viral RNA, to HIV RNAs, or just proteins we thought made sense to test, and we t I think we tested about 100 cDNAs in the end. And three different families gave very uh, strong uh, boosting effects to virus assembly, or virus production, I should say. So first of all, there are the SR proteins. This is a uh, family of about 11 proteins, I think, in humans. They are characterized by an arginine serine-rich motif. And you can see the, uh, uh, but particularly SRP40 and SRP55, are very strong stimulators of viral production in this mouse cell assay system. We were particularly looking for genes that where the human gene would work and the mouse one wouldn't, and this clearly does not fall into that category because both the human and the mouse uh, versions of these two genes stimulate equivalently. The same could be said of SAM68, another uh, uh, protein that has a rich history of being involved in RNA metabolism. Uh, again, human and mouse work similarly. However, CRIM1, which is a protein I mentioned earlier, which is a nuclear export receptor that binds to REV, was rather different in that hum, cr, human CRIM1 would stimulate virus production in mouse cells, whereas overexpression of the mouse version actually did rather little. So we then decided to um, continue doing further work on uh, human CRIM1. 
So in this uh, experiment, we're just looking at uh, the effects of transfecting in mouse and human CRIM1 in both um, primate and rodent cell lines to look at their stimulation of uh, particle production using the same gag pole expression vector. And you can see both in 3T3 cells and L cells, the human CRIM1 is a very good uh, stimulator of virus particle production. Whereas in three different uh, primate cell lines, uh, the, these two are human and this one is African green monkey, there was no stimulation of virus particle production. And this again was not a, not a consequence of expression level because in host cells expression levels were rather low but there was no uh, stimulation. We've always felt that uh, looking at uh, the viral RNA pattern is very important when looking at anything to do with Rev function because, uh, as I explained to you earlier, when Rev is absent, unspliced viral RNA can't get into the cytoplasm, and when, when Rev is present, it does. And you can see this here, just looking, uh, you just need to look at the left hand panel here. This is a northern blot looking at the different sizes of viral RNA. So for a Rev minus virus, you see no unspliced RNA appearing in the cytoplasm. So in mouse cells, this export is rather poor, so you see very low levels of these unspliced RNAs in the cytoplasm. But you can see when you add human CRIM1, there's pretty good accumulation of unspliced RNA in the cytoplasm. So this would argue then that the reason <coughs> uh, that, that human CRIM1 is stimulating uh, virus particle production in mouse cells is because it is, it is uh, acting to enhance the function of the Rev protein and therefore get more unspliced RNA into the cytoplasm, which is a substrate for synthesizing the gag and pole proteins that make up the core of virus particles. We wanted to quantify this in more detail, and again, we went back to doing our very careful pulse chase experiments, sorry, just pulse experiments, look at levels of gag synthesis, and you can see here, as you add in human CRIM1, in the context, in this case, of a, of a full-length HIV provirus, you can see that you get about a approximately five-fold boost in protein th synthesis rates, which is about the same level of induction of, of unspliced RNA uh, accumulation you see in that previous slide, arguing then that, that the effect of human CRIM on HIV assembly actually is purely at the level of moving unspliced RNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, so you make more gag protein and therefore make more particles. It is not actually affecting assemblies per se, so as I said at the, at the outset, there are defects both at uh, RNA metabolism and assembly. We think that CRIM1 is only affecting the RNA metabolism side of things, and we've yet to discover why, uh, for example, changing the CTE will boost the assembly of the protein that's already in the cytoplasm. So we continue to work in this area. Um, I don't, I've sort of said that already. Um, Interestingly, we think that the uh, SR proteins and CRIM are working at completely different steps of uh, replication, as you might imagine. So if you add uh, human CRIM together with the SR proteins, you get a further boost to virus production. So how the SR proteins are promoting virus assembly uh, and release is something that uh, we continue to work on as well. Now, we wanted to get at why, what was the difference between mouse and human uh, CRIM1. So they're in fact very, it's a very, very well conserved gene. If you compare the mouse and the human alleles of, of CRIM1, there are only 21 amino acid differences in a protein that is 1,071 amino acids long. So it's a very long protein. Uh, structurally, it's, the structure has been solved by a couple of groups, uh, including Dirk Gorlick. And it is composed of 21 heat repeats. And heat repeats are two uh, antiparallel alpha helices separated by a, 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 a loop. And so it's a toroid of, tw of 21 of these uh, heat repeats, sort of like a cylinder. <clears throat> and if you look at where the amino acid changes are, they're, in, uh, they're, they're, they're clustered quite heavily. So here is a linear drawing of uh, CRIM. And where all the amino acid differences are are these little hatch marks here. And you can see a lot of them uh, map to these heat repeats here, 9A or the helix, in nine, helix 9A and helix 10A. So we did what molecular biologists always do, and that's make a load of chimeric proteins to try and map where the functional differences were. And if you make a chimera that is mouse, human, mouse here, almost has full uh, function in the, in the transfection-based assays. And in fact, you can just make three amino acid changes here, 
if you just humanize these three residues, 411, 412, and 414, you end up with a protein which has pretty reasonable function. If you take the human protein and mutate those three residues, we haven't actually done this, but somebody else has, you lose uh, function in this type of assay. So this region here, 9A in particular, is really important for the species specificity of uh, the crim protein. And as I said to you earlier, here is, a, here is zooming in on a structure there. Uh, here, is, here, is, uh, here is heat repeat uh, 9, and here is uh, 9 a, the 9A helix shown here. And you can see these residues all lie on the outside of the protein, suggesting they, they can then interact with, with another ligand. Now, our expectation was because this protein, because these differences between mouse and human were reflected in, in uh, REV function, it would probably be important for the interaction with REV. Now, where REV binds to the, uh, any, to CRIM1 had previously been resolved, uh, the REV uh, nuclear export signal actually binds here, quite a long way away from these residues uh, that are important for species specificity, which leaves us with the question, what, what is it that this element does that affects the ability of REV that's binding over to function when it's binding uh, over here. Uh, we've also done a load of phylogenetic analyses looking at the different CRIM proteins. And you can see here, here is an, the ancestral sequence in this region here. And it's rather interesting. It's actually mouse and, and primates are the two outliers, really. Um, this region is incredibly well conserved through evolution, except there are mouse has accumulated, a rodents have accumulated a load of changes, as have primates. And of course, if you add the 10 and the 9 together, you end up with the 21 um, amino acid changes between mouse and uh, human. And as I say, many of them map to this heat repeat 9A. And in fact, the ancestral sequence here also is non functional. We made chimeras there, and that is a non functional sequence as well in terms of uh, boosting rev function in these types of assays. Now, it's very popular when you've got um, viral cofactors or, or cellular factors that, that affect virus replication to look at uh, evidence of positive selection. So positive selection in a sequence, not talking about immunology here, but talking about sequence of a, of a gene. So if, if amino acid change, if, if a nucleotide changes in a gene, nearly always bring an amino acid change that's taken, uh, that's what's called positive selection. And that is often taken as a signature of a host pathogen interaction. And, and over the years, they will battle with each other. One will change and the other will change in response and then the other will change and that will drive up positive selection. And that is very obvious in many of these restriction factors. You can see clear evidence of positive selection in the, in the uh, cellular genes. We can't actually find that um, in CRIM1. Perhaps there is because it's just above one if you, can, if you root the tree to, a, to a, a common ancestor horse here. But really, we found no good evidence of uh, positive Darwinian selection. So we're not sure if the host pathogen interaction has driven these changes. So a more conservative estimate would be that the CRIM1 gene has at some point, there's been a relaxation of selection pressure, then possibly purifying selection after that. And that's why you get these... Uh, very restricted areas of change. So HIV, uh, gag RNA, biogenesis, and trafficking are determined for species tropism, as I said earlier. Human CRIM1 is compromised in its capacity to support HIV1 rev function. Human CRIM1 promotes uh, HIV1 production in murine cells by stimulating rev function and uh, uh, genomic RNA export. Human CRIM does not improve the assembly capabilities of GAG per se. Its action is therefore fundamentally different from what the constitutive transport element is doing. Regions of CRIM1 have been subject to bursts of sequence diversification and selection, but we can't say it's positive selection. But it's interesting to speculate that the evolution of CRIM1 uh, to resist previous infections perhaps may have conferred a modern-day vulnerability in, in humans to HIV-1 uh, infection by making it particularly susceptible to REV working. So what is the basis for, for poor HIV gag function and membrane targeting in murine cells when RNA export is regulated by REV RE? And we're, we are continuing to look for additional cofactors. Perhaps it's the proteins like the SR. Proteins are very important for this. Another uh, future question is how do uh, heat repeats 9A and 10A of human CRIM1 uh, 
elements with no previously recognized activity impact HIV rev function. This is something to do with export complex conformation, stability, composition, etc. And here, we, we don't actually work on this anymore. We're not um, good enough biochemists, I think, to take this forward. But uh, Alan Frankel and uh, one of his students, David Booth at UCSF, we've been working with them a bit on this uh, to try and address the basis for this. And this is um, actually from a paper of Alan's a couple of years ago, their model for how the REV RE uh, nuclear export complex uh, forms. Here you have a RNA model here. Here you have uh, three dimers of REV, and they see CRIM1 sitting down below here, and this orange piece here would be the nuclear export sequence of REV interacting with CRIM1. So the second area I want to talk about is VIF, uh, which is a, another uh, accessory protein that we've worked on for, for many years. And the reason we got into this uh, 15 or 20 years ago was that VIF is absolutely required for replication if you look in primary cells. So in primary human T cells, a virus that lacks a VIF protein is unable to replicate at all. And again, using the cell fusion experiment, <clears throat> as it turned out, a number of immortalized T cell lines would support the growth of a VIF minus virus. If you take uh, the cells of the two phenotypes, fuse them together, in this case, in contrast to the assembly experiments where you fuse mouse and human cells and you can recapitulate assembly, when you, when you fuse permissive and non-permissive cells for, uh, for supporting the growth of a VIF minus virus, it is a non-permissive phenotype that wins out and VIF minus virus still can't be infectious coming out of a cell fusion. So this argued, in fact, these cells that restrict the growth of a VIF minus uh, virus, in fact, lack, or sorry, express something which is an inhibitor of virus replication. So very different to the lack of an assembly cofactor, it's a presence of some inhibitory factor. So we use that as a match cell lines of these two types to look for genes that would be present in these cells but absent from these cells that would uh, inhibit a VIF minus virus. And after many years' work, uh, a former postdoc in the lab, Ann Sheehy, identified one particular gene which, which wound up with this name, which I'll explain in a second, called apobec 3 g which when you co-express it with a VIF minus virus <clears throat> is a very potent inhibitor of its infectivity, but a wild-type virus is basically untouched. <clears throat> apobec 3 g it turned out, fell into a family of 11 uh, human genes shown here, <clears throat> all of which contain one or two copies of this structural motif here, which was first solved by uh, Reuben Harris, uh, in 2008. And what this domain does, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a domain that mediates cytidine deamination in the context of RNA or DNA. That is taking a cytidine, removing this amino group and replacing it with oxygen, and that will change cytidine into uridine. Now, in fact, there are proteins in this family have been described before. The original one is APABEC1, which is an acronym for apolipoprotein B editing uh, editing complex polypeptide 1, so hence Apobec 1, and that's why all these fam this whole family has been called the Apobec family. This is a s RNA expressed in the small intestine of, uh, of humans, and this editing event is very important for producing a truncated apolipoprotein B, which is very important for the absorption of dietary fats. A second uh, enzyme in this family is AID, very familiar to immunologists. This is the the enzyme in B cells that drives antibody diversification. <clears throat> and in both cases, they were known uh, deaminators of cytidine in the context of RNA or DNA, which led to the question, was Apobec 3G um, uh, mediating cytidine deamination in the context of, of HIV infection? And indeed it was, and I'll show you a summary of that in a second. But before I do that, I just want to highlight, in fact, there are many Apobec 3 proteins and several of them are also antiviral, and I'll come to this point later. Apobec 3G is certainly a potent inhibitor of HIV. 3F inhibits uh, HIV. 3DE also inhibits HIV to some extent, and certain alleles of 3H inhibit uh, HIV. <coughs> Work from many groups show that, in fact, in the context of HIV infection, when VIF is absent, Apobec 3G is a potent deaminator of retroviral reverse transcripts. So to summarize that work, so here is, here is a, a cell producing virus particles, and this is in the absence of VIF. Apobec 3G or 3F, for example, will get trapped in an assembling virus particle, shown here in these uh, orange uh, shapes. 
and that, that virus particle will get into a target cell. It will uncoat and it will start to reverse transcribe. DNA will be produced here. And what will happen is if this DNA has cytidines in it, which obviously it will, a certain percentage of time, those cytidines will be deaminated by uh, the enzyme to, to turn them into uridines. And if those DNAs are maintained in those cells, you end up with, with DNAs that contain mutations in them. And it's, uh, <clears throat> in any given DNA, you can, in fact, get up to about 10% of the uh, cytidines can be mutated, which on the plus strand will give you uh, guanosine to adenosine mutations. So you can have... So in a virus that's 10,000 bases long, if you mutate... Um, 10% of the, the G residues, that's about 300 mutations, and that will severely inhibit the virus. In fact, with that level of mutagenesis, the virus is, uh, is, is rendered completely inert. Uh, and then a second uh, level of activity, which I will describe in some detail, uh, these enzymes are also able to inhibit um, reverse transcription, but they are certainly very potent mutators of viral DNA. And that is true for uh, 3G, 3F, 3D, and 3H. What does VIF do? I'm not going to say too much about that, but many groups have studied this. <clears throat> VIF, in fact, overcomes APOBEC3 proteins by rather straightforward mechanisms. It, the VIF protein recruits a ubiquitin ligase complex, the components of which are shown here. It's a RBX2, a, a, a ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, a Cullin 5 scaffold protein, elongin B and C. So VIF will bind through a complex series of interactions which is helped by this recently identified cofactor uh, CBF beta. <clears throat> and when this complex forms, it is able to uh, recruit apobec 3 g because VIF also binds apobec 3 g and 3F directly. So you get this large complex, which then brings, I'm losing my pointer, unfortunately, um, that then brings apobec 3 g into the proximity of this ubiquitin ligase complex, which will result in the polyubiquitulation of the apobec protein. And when it's polyubiquitulated, it will be driven to the proteasome where it will be degraded. And in the context of an infected cell, if the apobec proteins are degraded, they can no longer be packaged into nascent virus particles and can therefore no longer able to exert their antiviral phenotype. And this, uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand this complex because, of course, any pharmacologic inhibition of it at any of these interfaces will, in fact, allow uh, A3G or A3F to evade the inhibitory effects of VIF and therefore able to naturally exert a potent antiviral effect. So there's a lot of structural work, a lot of pharmacological work going on trying to identify inhibitors and understand how this complex forms. <clears throat> Back to how the APOBEC3 proteins themselves work. So I, I summarize that they're very potent mutators. But it became apparent uh, several years ago that, in fact, this isn't the only thing they do. So in this series of experiments, either looking at wild-type apobec proteins or, or mutant versions that can no longer mediate cytidine deamination through introducing point mutations, you can see that in all these cases, you're able to get a fairly good inhibition of viral infectivity, although there is a clear rank order with wild-type apobec 3G being the most potent and the editing deficient apobec 3G being the least potent, but it can still reduce viral titers by about a log. If you look at the accumulation of viral DNAs in target cells, you see the same rank order of, of inhibition of, of viral DNA accumulation as you see of the inhibition of infectivity. And the same is also true if you look at reverse transcription in vitro using isolated virus particles. So wild type apobec 3G is a very potent inhibitor in the accumulation of reverse transcripts. Uh, but yet these, muta these mutated proteins here also are able to pretty well inhibit viral uh, DNA accumulation. Now this, over the years, turned out to be a very controversial subject with these types of experiments criticized for using heavily overexpressed proteins, mutated versions, what have you. So we've gone back and done a very detailed analysis of um, wild-type and VIF-deficient virus particles coming out of primary CD4 T cells from a number of uh, seronegative HIV donors. So because we can't manipulate the APOBEC3 proteins directly, we just use the fact that wild-type virus will, will encode VIF, and this will largely, over, will largely degrade the APOBEC proteins in virus-producing cells. So we did this in three different donors. So we end up with three sets of wild-type and three sets of VIF-deficient virus particle. And you can see here how much less APOBEC3 protein is present in the wild-type particles. 
The loss of infectivity here in a single cycle is uh, 10 to 20 fold. If you look at endogenous reverse transcription, you're looking at uh, uh, isolated virus particles, there's a severe deficit in their ability to produce uh, reverse transcripts when the APOBEC3 proteins are present and VIF is absent, about tenfold in that particular uh, assay. You go on and look at uh, uh, infections in, in primary T cells, you see the same thing, there's a big drop in the accumulation of viral DNAs in target cells when uh, APOBEC3 proteins are present and VIF is absent. You can see this irrespective of the donor use or irrespective uh, of the target cell. Um, in a variety of different experiments, including measuring the addition of the very first base of reverse transcription onto the tRNA primer, as well as uh, the early phase of reverse transcription, there's a very strong processivity to the inhibition of reverse transcription. So the longer the reverse transcript is that you look at, the bigger the deficit in its synthesis when the APOBEC 3G is there. So we're very keen to understand the basic mechanism of this, and there are two types of mechanism you could think about which we have not resolved yet. The first is that there could be a, you could, for example, APOBEC 3G could be binding to viral RNA and preventing the processivity of reverse transcriptase along the RNA, or it could be binding to reverse transcriptase itself and inhibiting its enzymatic function and stopping it by stopping it moving along the template. So we're starting to do more and more uh, in vitro type experiments to try and examine this. And here's one example. This is an in vitro assay using a synthetic template and purified enzymes in vitro. So here's, and this is looking at, which will be the strong stop DNA. So you have a, a primer and a, and a template, and this will be reverse transcription, transcriptase just dropping off the end of the template. So this is a full length product. If you add apobec recombinant apobec 3G to these assays, you see a, a substantial decrease in the amount of that product. 7SL RNA, we use this for these experiments because 7SL is a defined, very strong uh, RNA ligand for APOBEC 3G. We have no idea why this is, but if you look at the RNAs that are bound to APOBEC 3G in, t in cells, 7SL is strongly selected for. This is, in fact, the RNA that's in the signal recognition particle. Why that would be, we don't know yet. Um, but if you add um, increasing concentrations of 7SL RNA to these reactions, you can see a you know, stronger and stronger decrease to the effect of APOBEC 3G I. You see a better and better rescue of reverse transcription, but there's no effect when there's no APOBEC 3G there. So this is arguing then that we think the RNA binding capabilities of APOBEC 3G are very important for its ability to inhibit reverse transcription, potentially by binding to the RNA substrate and preventing um, reverse transcriptase moving along. Now the stopping points um, in reverse transcription, they don't seem to be particularly site-specific, but we're doing a lot more analysis to try and address that. In those same experiments, looking in the, uh, with the different virus preps from different donors going into different cells from different donors, we've done a lot of sequencing of those RNAs to look at the patterns of uh, mutation. And just to summarize some of those results, you can see that the percentage of, of guanosine residues that are mutated increase over time. So the editing is not a co-reverse transcription event. It occurs after reverse transcription and continues to go on for some time. Um, also, the percent of sequences mutated. In the absence of VIF, you end up with essentially almost 100% of sequences end up mutated. Even in the case of wild-type virus, that is um, a virus that has VIF and very little apobec, apobec proteins around, you do see a small number of uh, mutated sequences. Um, looking at the number of mutations per sequence, you can see for the VIF-deficient viruses by 24 hours, a lot of sequences contain very large number of mutations. This, we're only looking at a 500 base uh, sequence here, so over 10 mutations per, uh, per DNA. And there are very few that escape with no mutations, in contrast with a wild-type virus, where there's very little APOBEC3 protein around. Most of these sequences escape mutation, and a few have a few mutations, and I'll come back to the possible meaning of this a little bit later. Now, interestingly, different APOBEC3 proteins display different preferences for the, for the sequences they mutate. So APOBEC3G to, prefers to mutate at CC dinucleotides, whereas the rest of them prefer to go to TC dinucleotides. 
And this is GG on the plus strand, and this would be GA. So by looking at where mutations occur, you can infer whether it was caused by either apobec 3 g or one of the other apobec proteins. And when you do that type of analysis and you take all those sequences I just showed you, accumulate them all, uh, group them all together, you can see that by far the majority of mutations occur at guanosine-guanosine dinucleotides, arguing that apobec 3 g is by far and away the predominant deaminase mediating uh, the antiviral effect in primary T cells. There's been a lot of debate over which apobec 3 proteins are most important. We think this type of analysis states very strongly that apobec 3 g causes probably at least 90% of any antiviral effect uh, mediated by apobec 3 proteins. And so for any future therapeutic efforts, that is the enzyme uh, people ought to focus on. So just to summarize this part then, so while apobec 3 protein mediated hypermutation is clearly antiviral through uh, error catastrophe as I described, these proteins also exert editing independent effects. Based on the local sequence patterns of mutations, we think apobec 3 g is a predominant antiviral protein in CD4 T cells. Endogenous reverse transcription assays indicate that apobec 3 proteins in impede the processivity of cDNA synthesis following the addition of the first base. And we think that, in fact, by using two mechanisms for viral inhibition, both editing and the inhibition of reverse transcription, a very potent uh, antiviral effect is then able to be exerted. And we should sort of just note generally that the post-entry um, uh, uh, reverse transcription complexes are particularly vulnerable to inhibition, we think. Not only do the apobec 3 proteins seem to be working around here, at least two other of the restriction factors that have been identified for HIV also seem to work around this part of the life cycle, the TRIM5-alpha protein and also SAMHD1. Um, <clears throat> We've also been very interested in what are the potential cellular functions of Afibec 3 proteins, and this has been rather hard to get out. They clearly do have effects in the cells, and in fact, very recently there was a, 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 a deep sequencing project from uh, one of the breast cancer consortia noticed that there are quite a lot of mutations that accumulate in breast cancers have the hallmark of Afibec 3 mutations. Uh, they tend to occur at uh, GA dinucleotides. So we think that the regulation of apobec 3 proteins is probably quite important in cells because you wouldn't really want these proteins getting into the nucleus and mutating a, a genomic DNA. So we've taken, we took a, a, a proteomic approach to looking at this several years ago. So we expressed 3G or 3F in T cells, purified out the complexes by affinity chromatography, and looked at the proteins that are in complexes. Now, the first thing to say is that these complexes are large ribonuclear protein complexes, and particularly obvious for apobec 3 g if you treat the complex that you, put, you, you can affinity purify with a ribonuclease, almost all the proteins are lost. But before you do that, if you do mass spectrometry to identify the proteins in there, you find a lot of RNA binding proteins, as you might imagine. In fact, this list has quite a lot of overlap with data that Alessandro was showing me this morning for his... Um, is pulled down of uh, viral RNA, HIV uh, viral RNAs from cells. Um, some of them are quite interesting proteins, this one in particular, MOV10, as well as there are proteins in here which, which localize to distinct microdomains in cells called P bodies or mRNA, mRNA processing bodies, as well as stress granules. And in fact, if you do uh, microscopy experiments, you can see that apobec proteins very strongly localized to both of these uh, uh, RNA-rich microdomains in cells. So first of all, the P bodies over here, uh, MOV10, a putative RNA helicase, and Argonaut 1, an effector of uh, risk complexes, they both uh, mark P bodies very dramatically, and, and you can see very strong co-localization between apobec proteins and these two proteins over here. And if you stress cells, in this case we used heat, you can see that the apobec 3 proteins go into these stress granules that are marked uh, with various uh, typical markers. So there's been a lot of interest in why this might be. Just to summarize for some of you, P-bodies and stress granules are ways of uh, regulating various, viral R various uh, cellular RNAs. Uh, P-bodies are sites of RNA degradation, whereas stress granules are sites of storing, uh, translationally stalled uh, RNAs, which can then be retranslated later when uh, stress goes away. 
but they've been implicated in the replication cycles of many viruses and transposable elements. So there's been a lot of interest whether they affect uh, HIV replication. And the literature, I would say, is rather uh, controversial in this area. So we've done some work in this area to address whether P bodies are important in HIV replication, as they have been reported to be by a number of groups. And the approach we took was to use siRNA to knock out P-body proteins and P-bodies themselves. And one that works very well is DDX, whoops, DDX6, which is a um, uh, RNA helicase. If you knock out uh, uh, DDX6 here by siRNA, it's about uh, at least 90% gone. You lose over 90% of P-bodies that you can visualize under a microscope. And our feeling is that knocking out P-bodies has no substantial effect on either virus production virus infectivity or the capacity of APOBEC3 proteins to inhibit uh, HIV. So why APOBEC3 proteins should go to P bodies is completely unclear to us because we see no evidence for uh, P bodies being important for APOBEC3 protein function as it pertains to HIV. And in fact, we can't find any convincing evidence that P bodies themselves have any relevance to HIV replication, uh, which is in, in uh, contrast to a number of other uh, papers in the literature, I would say. Uh, but we've done some experiments with MOV10 as well, which is a helicase that came down in those, um, in those biochemical experiments. Uh, it's a probable RNA helicase. It's associated with the uh, Apobec uh, RNPs. In fact, they're associated with many, uh, it's associated with many RNAs. Also associates with argonaut proteins, risk complexes, accumulates in P bodies. It's been reported to be important in various RNA silencing processes. And uh, several groups have shown that if you force overexpression of the MOV10 helicase, putative helicase, it's a very potent suppressor of HIV uh, production, assembly and uh, production in cells, release, as well as the infectivity of those particles. As well as it can also uh, inhibit the retrotransposition of various endogenous elements. I should say that um, so we've gone about trying to look at that. So I would say when you, when you, when you overexpress, that's certainly true. We agree with all of that. However, when you knock them out, and we've got an shRNA that works really well against uh, MOV10. So you can hear a very effective knockout of MOV10. When you knock that out, it has absolutely no, well, has no substantial or significant effect on either the production of HIV or the inf infectivity of HIV in two different cell lines. So we think that the overexpression, the fact that overexpressed MOV10 inhibits HIV is probably an epiphenomenon because removing the endogenous protein has no effect. In contrast, however, uh, transposons are substantially affected. So if you knock out MOV10, you can see a, a, a strong boost to the retrotransposition of an in, of a, of a LTR containing a retrotransposon. And even more impressively, to non-LTR retrotransposons, we see a very strong stimulation of their movement as well when MOV10 is removed. You can overcome this effect by putting back the RNAi resistant and RNAi resistant version of MOV10. <coughs> However, MOV10 knockdown does not impact apoBIC3 mediated suppression of HIV infection. So we don't think there's any significant relationship between MOV10 and apoBIC3, but we are very interested as to why MOV10 seems to be a pretty important uh, regulatory mechanism for trans endogenous transposons. And in fact, it joins an increasingly long list of proteins that can regulate uh, transposable elements. And some of them are just listed here. Uh, the uh, ATM protein can control transposable elements. apoBEC 3 b actually uh, does as well, as do um, uh, one of the processing enzymes in the uh, siRNA pathway. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting that recent data have suggested that transposable elements are far more mobile than we thought. And in fact, in the brain, there's a huge amount of somatic retrotransposition going on. So we think the proteins of all these types may be very important in limiting the amount of retrotransposition and stop it going completely wild and losing all uh, genetic integrity in certain cells. I finally just want to come to a couple of final comments about apoBEC3 proteins and the evidence that they really encounter HIV during natural infection. So there are several arguments that they do. First of all, circulating viruses uh, encode functional VIF proteins, implying that inhibiting apoBEC3 proteins is very important. 
it turns out if you look at different SIVs and HIV, SIVs from different species, the ability of, <clears throat> of an ancestral virus to, to, to move into a new host correlates with the VIF functionality of contemporary viruses uh, in those species. So for example, African green monkey SIV, uh, that vi those VIF proteins do not work in human cells, and that virus never seems to have been transmitted to humans, whereas the VIF proteins from SIVs from chimpanzees or Sutu mangabees, viruses which have been transmitted to humans, those VIF proteins from those viruses do work in human cells. Um, <clears throat> apobec 3 f and 3G are expressed in the natural cell targets of HIV infection, T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. There seems to be a correlation between higher expression of 3G and 3F in vivo and improved clinical outcome for people that are infected with HIV, and hypermutated sequences are readily detected during natural infection. So I want to come back to whether these rare sequences that we identified in our in, our, uh, in vitro in, those particular in vitro experiments where you have one or two mutations, whether rather than being uh, deleterious, which of course these very high, viral, high mutational loads will inhibit virus through, through error catastrophe, whether these low numbers of mutations, actually rather than being inhibitory, may actually be beneficial to the virus. So that would be uh, uh, schematically represented here, where you can imagine uh, increasing viral load from left to right on this theoretical graph where the one or two mutations could be beneficial to the virus by driving the acquisition of useful mutations, whereas high, viral load, high mutational loads, when you've got very strong apobec activity, is inhibitory for all the reasons I've already described. And the system we decided to use to look at that in vitro was uh, resistance to the drug 3TC. And the major mutation, or a mutation that gives rise to 3T3 resistant, is at position 184 in reverse transcriptase, and that is the, the mutation of this guanosine residue to an adenosine residue, which changes methionine to isoleucine at this position, and this is actually a apobec 3 g consensus site. So we wonder whether the development of resistance uh, to, the, to, to 3TC and resistance could actually be promoted by apobec 3 g we should then help make the argument apobec 3G could be beneficial under some circumstances. So we made cell lines that do or do not express apobec 3G. And then GRU virus, uh, wild, this is all wild type virus, so it has a VIF protein which, should, which largely but not completely uh, must inhibit apobec 3G. And then we looked at the growth of viruses in the presence or absence of 3TC in the presence or absence of apobec 3G. So in the, absence of apobec, in the absence of 3TC, the virus grows just as well whether 3G is there or not, and that's because it's got a VIF gene. When you add 3TC <coughs> at high levels, um, when 3G is not present in those cells, the virus is inhibited, as one might expect. But when 3G is present, in fact, the virus seems to survive, arguing that the presence of apobec 3G was able to promote virus replication or virus survival when, uh, when high concentrations of this drug was present. So we then, to, to, to look at whether this really makes any sense in terms of potential mechanism, you have to go and do some sequencing of those viruses. And indeed, that experiment was actually done in a, a quadruplet. And you can see that in two out of the four cultures, we got the M184 to I mutation, became the dominant mutation rather quickly. In one case, we got the, an M184 to V mutation, which is a mutation driven by uh, misincorporation by reverse transcriptase, but also confers resistance. We also went on to do deep sequencing, and you can see in the two, not surprisingly, in the two cultures that had the rapidly accumulated the M184 to I mutation, you see that mutation coming up very quickly. That one's the M184 to V. And even in the, in the culture where it wasn't the predominant mutation, you could see it starting to accumulate here. So if this experiment had gone on longer, it too would have become, this culture would also have become, uh, virus would have been growing very well in that culture in the presence of 3TC. If you do bulk sequencing, in, or sorry, deep sequencing, um, even in the cultures that are not being selected with 3TC, you can see the, the starting accumulation of the, of the uh, M184. 184 to I mutation at that position, uh, even in, in the absence of drug selection, arguing that 3G then is, is, in, is exerting mutations uh, which can be selected for uh, in the context uh, of, of drug selection. So we, we think that this 
strongly argues that under some circumstances, the APOBEC3 proteins, in fact, can be beneficial uh, to the virus. So just to summarize everything I've said about APOBEC proteins, they were initially discovered through their HIV inhibitory effects, as well as uh, by other groups, by their uh, sequence similarity to, to APOBEC1 and AID. APOBEC3 proteins are antiviral effectors that operate through editing dependent and independent mechanisms. Under some circumstances, HIV appears to be able to exploit these enzymes to acquire a benefit. And we think this may help why, explain why lentiviruses evolved a rather complicated evasion mechanism, namely VIF, as opposed to simply avoiding encapsidation. So you could argue, well, why doesn't the virus just stop packaging APOBEC 3G through some other mechanism so it just never, or perhaps would even grow in cells that don't express APOBEC 3. It hasn't used any of those mechanisms. It's actually used this rather complicated balance and counterbalance mechanism, which we think, under some circumstances, may uh, be exploited by the virus to generate uh, sequence diversity. So just to thank some of the people uh, in the lab that have done, done uh, this work. The work on uh, uh, assembly and CRIM1 was initiated by Chad Swanson uh, with a lot of contributions from Nathan Shearer. On VIF, that project was started many, many years ago in my lab uh, by James Simon, whose name doesn't exist, uh, doesn't, isn't on here. Uh, and she, he cloned the APOBEC3 proteins. And more recently, uh, Kieran Gillick, um, uh, Kate Bishop, and uh, Prab and Daya have all, all contributed to our work on APOBEC uh, 3 proteins. Thank you very much for your attention.